Welcome everyone to FARM's weekly Wednesday webinar series. This series is brought to you in part by FARM's with a generous grant from the Otto Bremer Foundation. There's just a couple of housekeeping rules that I'd like to go over quickly with you. If you've never used this platform before, you should have a screen to the right that is a go to training control panel. There's ways to adjust your audio, um, share your webcam. There will be a evaluation that will pop up by email or on your screen. I can't remember how I have it set up. It would really do us a lot of good for future funding if you could please fill out that evaluation after this course is over with. And of course next week I won't be here on a Wednesday and so we're going to um, have you go look at some recorded webinars and or wait until February 18th you can sign up for any and all of these webinars on our webpage. I think that, uh, let's take a peek here real quick. Cool Fruits for Cold Climates, Kathy Wiederholt is going to be here on February 18th. That'll be an awesome presentation, I'm sure. Today, we have Tessa Tripp from International Certification Services. They are a partner of ours down in Medina. We share a building and a beautiful office space. They hire probably about 14 or 15 folks. It's really a fun place to go and visit. So if you're ever in Medina, stop on by. And if I'm at the farm's office, I'll um, show you our wonderful classroom. And then we'll go to lunch at the wonderful Medina Cafe. It makes an awesome sauerkraut burger. Okay, I'm getting sidetracked. Anyway, Tessa's gonna talk to us today about what you need to do to become organic certified. They certify um, all kinds of things, and I'm gonna let her tell you a little bit more about herself. I will mute all of you. If you have questions, raise your hand. There's a little column there next to your name, and I will wait for a pause, and I will open up your microphone so you can ask, or you can wait till after Tessa's done, and we can ask all the questions at once, or you can type them into the chat box down here at the bottom, and I will be fielding that for her so she doesn't have to worry about it. And without further ado, I'm going to make her the presenter, and then... Once we can see, um, oh, okay, Tessa Tripp needs to switch to the desktop version of GoToMeeting to be a presenter. What are you working on? Oh. Oh. I'm going to send Let that to me. you. Um, okay, please do. Oh, my apologies, Sue. That's okay. If you can um, follow those instructions, we'll see what happens. We'll give you just a minute. Oh, it says I'm the presenter. Oh, okay. Well, I can't see your... Can you do show my screen? Up, up there. To show your screen. And then once we can see your screen, then maybe, maybe we're off the hook here, huh? <laughs> Okay, so I'm clicking to share my screen. Okay, it takes a minute with so, so sometimes slow connections. So I see that you're the presenter, so we're on the right track. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. Did it give you any other instructions? No, it just says, because I go to that side panel, share your screen, and it says you'll be asked to download a plugin to enable sh screen sharing in this version of GoToTraining. So please close all confidential windows. And I click download and I get nothing. So oh, sure. did you email whatever to me or not? Well, you should actually... I'm just kind of curious. How did you how did you log on? Did you use the link that you got when you I did. I did. Yep, I did. So there shouldn't be any problem there. I don't understand why I can't see your screen. It says you're the presenter. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Oh shoot. I don't know what to do to fix this. I've never come across this before. Do you have that little um, daisy on your computer anywhere? The one that uh, says go to meeting version 6.4.10? Oh, okay, for Brian and Kelly and Travis, she must have disconnected and is going to connect back up again. So I'm going to stop the recording for a minute.
and I'm not going to panic. <laughs> We are, we are. All right, we're back again on our weekly Windsor webinar, and I won't waste any more of your time with um, la 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 la. We're going to get started now, and we are recording, and I'm going to hit this and turn it over to you, Tessa. Great, thank you so much. And again, folks, I apologize for the technical difficulties. I'm going to have to investigate as to why I was having issues. Okay, so welcome to Becoming Certified Organic. And what I wrote underneath is considerations for your operation and what to expect throughout the process, meaning certify, you know, certifying organic process. I am Tessa Tripp. I'm a compliance specialist and a staff inspector here at International Certification Services in Medina. Uh, what that means is that I review organic system plans. I make final certification decisions, and I also have the honor of being a staff inspector. So I get out in the field and I actually get to uh, go to operations and inspect and make sure that the folks are are doing what they say they're doing and and visit with all those great folks out there. So um, if you want to change the slide, please. Okay, so the overview, basic overview for today, I, I tried to make it as brief as possible. Um, so since we're actually going right into, so you want to be certified organic, what's the next steps? Uh, choosing a certifying agent, the organic certification process, um, which is essentially defined by five steps to certification and then beyond after you achieve certification as well as resources that would be handy to you. Next slide please. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. There we go. Oh, did it go? There, now it did. Okay, so just um, the next couple slides, I'm just going to put uh, put out there just a little bit about us, who is ICS. And as Sue was mentioning, we uh, have approximately 15 full-time employees. We've been providing organic certification services since approximately 1980. Uh, we were established by a grower, organic trader, and an organic expert. So uh, pulling in all that experience has been very valuable for our company. Our accreditations include uh, accreditation to certify to the USDA National Organic Program, which is the headlining organic program, um, a federally defined uh, regulation, as well as accreditation to International Organic Accreditation Services to certify organic operations in Canada and Europe. And next slide, please. Uh, this is just an overview of the programs and services. I don't want to get too bogged down in it because uh, it starts to, it, it can get a little confusing, but essentially we do the National Organic Program Certification and Export Equivalencies, which means the U.S. Uh, National Organic Program signed uh, international trade agreements with the following countries that are mentioned on here to be able, if the product is certified in the U.S., it can export directly to those countries, which is very handy uh, to open up the, the barriers for export. We also do the Farm Verified uh, certification, which was our, our um, very first organic certification program prior to uh, the advent of the National Organic Program. Canada Organic Regime, so that's uh, for Canada-based operations, the Europe Organic Equivalents, uh, also BioSwiss Japan Standard. We also have uh, gluten-free certification, Food Alliance certification, and have uh, two new certifications on the roster, non-GMO project technical administrator with cooperation with where food comes from, which is our um, parent company. And then in that case, we certify, uh, we, we evaluate and certify or um, review products to be able to use the non-GMO project seal. And the Better Cotton Initiative verification, that is also a new verification program for us. So it's been very, very interesting. Next slide, please. Okay, so you want to be certified organic. You've actually made the big decision. Now what? So in order to really fully look at the big, bigger picture and to make sure that you're taking all the considerations that you should be uh, prior to diving in, organic certification, you know, what does it mean? Uh, the operation, your operation located anywhere in the world can com or complies with the USDA organic regulations, which I put in parentheses where, where those are located. So if you Googled that phrase, you'd find them. And this organic certification allows you to sell, label, and otherwise represent your products as organic. So 
identifying your markets is probably the most important um, ahead of time because you're going to want to be able to sell that product. You're going to want to find your niche and that is crucial for the money flow aspect to any operation. So really, really making sure that you have um, your market's identified, your sales locked in, or at least as close as you possibly can, or you 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 know that you can sell that product uh, to make sure that you have that cash flow is just vital. Uh, land parcel eligibility considerations, um, that goes to how long has it been since the application of a prohibited substance to land parcels. And per the land requirements, and this is straight out of the National Organic Program regulation, any field or farm parcel from which harvested crops are intended to be sold, labeled, and or represented as organic must have had no prohibited substances as listed in 205-105 apply to it for a period of three years immediately preceding the harvest of a crop. So you have to have a reasonable verification uh, if you've been managing the land for three years prior and you can you can verify that that uh, that you haven't applied those substances that's great if anybody else has managed it besides yourself within that 36 month period you're going to want to obtain written verification verification uh, to make sure that, that there wasn't any prohibited substances applied. But that is another consideration to take. When was the last time we put uh, anything, any chemical or any um, uh, GMO seed or anything like that on this parcel? And I inserted this one and I'm not trying to scare anybody, but it is time, paperwork, and money. And you can prioritize those in whichever fashion, you know, depending upon which matters to you the most. But obtaining organic certification and keeping it is not for the faint of heart. Uh, it's not super complex, but since organic is defined by a federal regulation, obtaining the actual certification to be organic, it does require time, money, and completion of paperwork. So uh, this is where uh, these factors can all depend on based upon the complexity and size of your operation. Now, if you have if you have a smaller operation that is, you know, for instance, a, a garden operation that you want to sell produce at the local local farmers market, uh, there can be your first of all, you're a smaller operation, and there's a little less complexity. So that can mean, you know, a little less time spent on all the details and a little less money spent on all the details, but as you get bigger and as your uh, processes get more complex, that's when things can get a little complicated. So be honest with yourself. What do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? What do you want to sell? Next slide, please. Hey, Sue, can you switch it for me? Oh, did that? I could see the, is it? Is it the one? Is it? Oh, it didn't switch for me. Okay, there okay. it is. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, right, okay. okay. I'm just <laughs> it takes a little time to go all the way to Medina. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Okay, so the next consideration and the most important consideration is choosing a certifying agent. There are many USDA accredited us certifying agents to choose from here and abroad, but we're concerned mostly with everybody wants to work with one in their country for the most part, so we're concerned about the ones here, but which one is right for you? So here are some points to consider and evaluate because you prioritize what matters the most. Um, do you want somebody who's closer to your farmer business? Do you want somebody, you want the cheapest person? Do you want the, um, do you want to export your your crop, whatever it may be, to other countries? So uh, that certifier, uh, there are some certifiers here in the U.S. that, that don't carry extra accreditation to um, be able to award you some e export equivalencies. So um, that's a consideration to take. What are my markets, both domestic and foreign? Um, additional services such as educational resources, member services, and exclusive customer support specialists. There are some certifying agencies that are... Um, established nonprofit agencies that will have both the um, certification wing and a uh, continuing or, or a educational uh, aspect to them so that you can go to that educational um, side and they have a specialist to assist you with any questions you may have. However, all certifiers are uh, able to provide you with, with resources um, outside of the, the spectrum with like outsourcing to ATRA or MOSES or which I will kind of cover those at the end what those are but they're uh, nonprofit educational um, and farms even uh, nonprofit educational places where you can go learn this stuff but 
uh, I know that there are several agencies that uh, now here at ICS, and I'm not not trying to break us up, but we do have uh, where we assign you to a customer care specialist who you only talk to that one person because sometimes in the jumble of correspondence back and forth, things can get you know lost if you're talking to several different people. So if it's a if you, if you money distance and and the accreditation stuff doesn't matter and you want that customer you know customer service aspect that's what you'd you'd go after but don't be afraid to actually really dive in and talk to these agencies and ask them uh, get really in depth ask them those in depth questions if and because there are a lot of times that not on purpose but there are details of the process or fees or whatever that are inadvertently missed and then people, you know, you can feel a little bit misinformed. So just just be as be as in depth as you can. Ask them all the questions you need to because the certifier is what's going to make the difference. Next slide, please. Okay, so the organic certification process as a whole. I actually use this the chart that's in here, and I, I apologize if it's not very easy to read, but. Um, the National Organic Program actually released a guidance document, and I, I named it here 2601, and it's called the Organic Certification Process. This is actually the, I should have given credit to them, but this is actually from that, that guidance document. They actually outline the organic certification process as they define it. So there are five steps to organic certification, and I'm going to cover those five steps in the next slides. Next one, please. Okay, so the first part, and they define step one as the application and fees. So once you have made the decision, you shopped around, you found the certifier that fits you best, uh, the process, this, at this point everything begins. You know, you've adopted your organic practices, you've, you've, you've verified that it's, your land is 36 months uh, applicant or substance, prohibited substance free, you're applying with the certifying agent. At this point, there you're gonna you're going to apply and the application is is broadly defined um, you, you fill out a form with your basic information you try to give the certifier a bit of a lowdown of what what you have total acres what you desire to be doing crops you want to be growing and then they're going to have you establish or implement an organic system plan and the organic system plan or OSP is the basis of compliance so you fill that out and it, it basically is like a, a biography it's a or a uh, it, it's meant to encompass or give us a picture of what you're doing on your on your operation. So be as 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 detailed as you need to be because the more detail up front provides provides a certifier with better um, easier. Uh, you can establish that the operation is compliant easier. Excuse me. Um, and then at that point, you will also submit applicable fees charged by the certifying agent of your choice because that is actually uh, the two things that the National Organic Program regulation covers in uh, one of their subsections is A, you fill out this organic system plan, and B, you pay the fees. Next one, please. OK, so you will just skip right into you've paid the money. They sent you the OSP, you completed it, you submitted it to the certifier. So now at this point, this is where it's our time as a certifier. So we're going to review your organic system plan and the following points are going to be assessed. So first off, completeness and compliance with the regulations. Um, first off, that's actually the only, what happens is if there's several questions that are unanswered and we're unable to determine compliance, we're going to come back and say, hey, can you please answer these questions? Or if there's a question that is answered um, in that maybe it indicates that your operation may not be compliant with a certain rule, we're going to we're going to ask for a little bit more information. We're going to kind of try to get to the bottom of it, bottom of everything and really clarify what's going on. Um, this and this may be achieved in two ways, like I said, obtaining or clarifying information prior to scheduling the inspection or instructions, very detailed instructions are given to the inspector to collect the information on site. So if it's something that is um, most, most non-compliances are quite correctable. I'm sorry, what was that noise? Was that me? Mm -hmm. Sue? It could be a, a glitch in the internet. I didn't hear it. Okay. No, it's fine. It's fine. I'll just, I'll just keep going. Just keep anyway, going okay. So, um, 
the two ways, like I said, so we can we can do it one of two ways. If it's something that we just feel we we uh, certified absolutely cannot go on on site without really clarifying and correcting it first, so that we're we're not going on site and there's there's a big mess. We will ask ahead of time, but most of the time, we can give instructions to the inspector and they can really get a better picture of what's going on. Next slide, please. Okay, so. In this case, uh, certifiers determine that your organic system plan contains enough information to conclude that your operation is compliant with the organic regulations and you have received the written correspondence confirming an on-site on inspection will be scheduled. So at that point, uh, an, an inspector is assigned and they will communicate with you to confirm the date and time of inspection. So what happens during this inspection? Um, a lot of times there's a little bit, people are very, very nervous for their inspections and and you shouldn't be, and I know that's easier for me to say because I'm on the other end, but this is actually your time for your operation to shine. So um, really showcase what you have to, what you have there and, and be proud of what you have. And the purpose of this on-site inspection is for us to just come on site and assess whether the operation complies or has the ability to comply with the regulations. We're going to verify that the OSP accurately reflects the operations activities. So we're, we're how you answered in your OSP should reflect exactly what's going on in your operation. Um, and then we also are coming on site to ensure that prohibited substance, substances have not been applied in which uh, we obtain verification of this. Next slide, please. So the organic, the actual inspection itself, so I continued this, and to start, uh, typically the inspector will conduct an opening meeting, and they'll discuss the inspection inspection plan in general. This is what I'm here to look at, you know, do we want to do, uh, do we want to look at your papers first, do we want to go walk around, the, walk around the farm first. Um, they also define the role of the inspector um, and communicate the confidentiality of all the information and, like I said, outline the plan inspection activities. The inspector then reviews each production unit facility and site where the operation produces or handles organic products. And the inspection inclu is, does include, but isn't limited to, evaluation of the OSP on site. So as the, the copy of the OSP or the organic system plan that you sent to us, you are actually expected to make a copy or keep a copy for yourself. That's one of the first questions I usually ask in an on-site inspection is, can I see the copy of your organic system plan? And that's when, you know, it can be on your computer, so it can be electronic, it can be hard copy. As long as it's there and it is updated, I'm happy. Uh, for the crop producers, what we're going to do typically, we we go, I, I usually like to do the farm tour first. So we go check out the fields, we assess the um, assess adjoining land use if you have a conventional neighbor who is actively farming or owns land next door. We kind of talk about what's going on over there, take a look at the the um, borders, you know, or the fence lines, um, establishment of buffer zones to protect, which is a, a distance um, between your organic field and the other person's non-organic or conventional production in order to protect your organic production. Um, just general things like that. And for and the wild wild crop producers, I, I honestly, we don't have anybody who does wild crop stuff, but it, in that event, we would look at the designated harvest areas, sustainable pr harvest practices, reseeding or pruning, act pruning activities of the wild crop. Um, next slide, please. Uh, for livestock producers, it's going to be the same, uh, basic same thing as the crop producers, except we're going to visit uh, the livestock facilities, where it will include all the livestock facilities, so uh, the barns, the pastures, we're going to go look at the livestock and, and look, at, look at what's going on there. We're going to check the access to the outdoors, uh, feed and feed rations, we go over the feed and feed rations, uh, things like that. Uh, for handlers, and, and handlers, I included handlers in here because that is anybody who, um, handlers is, is a broad spectrum, but it encompasses anybody who's handling an organic product after after the harvest. So that can be anybody who processes product, uh, things like that. So in a handler inspection, we'll typically go over uh, the product composition, so what kind of product you're making, receiving, processing, pest control, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Verification of the operations production or handling capacity, evaluation of the record keeping system, and verification of activities through appropriate records. So after the farm tour, after the facility tour, 
uh, we sit down and we go through uh, the record keeping system. I will ask to see field records, uh, storage records, which would be bin records, um, pest control records, things like that, just to make sure that you're, you're keeping those records on site. Um, also, it, with first time first time operations, uh, this is a little less um, crucial. It, it may not happen, but reconciliation of the volume of organic products produced or received versus what's sold, um, also known as a trace back audit or in and out balance, and that's for that's for us to see that a you're keeping sufficient records to be able to track the product from the point it leaves your your farm or your facility back to the point where it was initially planted or brought into your facility for processing. So that's just kind of a back check to make sure, A, that your, your in-out balances, that the, um, if there's any errors or if there's any uh, difference in numbers that it would be expected because of uh, various types of loss, whether it's spilled on the ground or, or it's lost through processing. But it just uh, is another checkpoint for us. First-time operations are, have a little bit tougher of a time doing this because they haven't sold organic products. So usually that's a point where we discuss what records are you going to keep for your um, when you sell product. Um, and then also this can include, the inspection can include sampling of organic agricultural products for residue testing. Um, and the inspector will provide a receipt for any samples taken. So what happens is the National Organic Program has actually uh, uh, told us, handed down some guidance that we are supposed to take a percentage of samples uh, of agricultural product every year to ensure that there are no residues, uh, whatever that residue may be. Uh, and when there is, we are supposed to uh, confront that accordingly and and uh, just get a little more in depth with the operation as to how the contamination could have occurred. Because it doesn't mean that anybody's actually committing fraud a lot of times. A lot of times it means there may be a breakdown in the system of, A, when they were shipping the grain, was the container really clean? Um, so then it goes back to that operation's cleaning records and cleaning procedures. So um, the residue tests aren't, some people are very, very nervous about them, but essentially, if if there's a breakdown in the system where a residue does show up of a prohibited material not allowed under the National Organic Program, it does allow us and, and the operation as well to troubleshoot where did this go wrong. Next slide, please. Are you there? Yeah, I'm... Yeah, I'm just waiting. Is can I was just saying the next slide, please. Is it the organic certification step three? It says please note inspection. Do I have the right one? Uh, it changed for me. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Oh, now it did. Now it did. Okay, cool. It's just delayed for me. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, after the inspection is all conducted, we've looked at the field, we've looked at the cows, we or cows, chickens, whatever. We've looked at um, the paperwork where the inspector then conducts what's called an exit interview and also known as a closing meeting. Um, so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll say, you know, can I please take a few moments prior to this meeting and I put together anything, um, if there's any concerns or any possible, uh, they call them potential non-compliances, which really sounds extremely unfriendly, but honestly, um, it's just the minor things that may be missing. Um, and then at that point, if you can provide that missing information to me prior to actually signing off, I can add it into the file and thus the non-compliance can be corrected on site. Um, otherwise, uh, we finish up the meeting and sign off. And the one thing that, and I put it in big and bold, please note that inspections are not consulting visits. The inspectors are actually there to serve as the eyes, ears, and nose of the certifying agent. And most importantly, they're the eyes, ears, and nose of the consumer. So they're the ones, a lot of times, are the only ones that have uh, on-site or personal face-to-face um, -face contact with some of the operations. So they're there just to verify the facts. There are some, several, uh, there are people that, you know, want to ask some very in-depth questions. How do I, how do I establish this record? How do I fix this? And a lot of times they cannot answer that. They are allowed to pull out the regulation and show you this is what the regulation requires. So um, <laughs> it can get to be a, a little bit 
uh, tricky sometimes. So the inspectors are allowed to ask questions, they collect and provide the information and explain the regulations or the certifier's requirements but are prohibited from advising an operator on how to overcome the barrier to certification. So uh, in closing, please direct any and all specific uh, compliance issues to the certifier. So you've had your inspection, now what? The inspector sends it back to us we check things out and after looking whether the uh, after looking at everything if the operation c appears to comply so everything looks good records look good you're keeping your records um, there's no practices that are prohibited under the NLP being performed we will make the following certification recommendations a certification if they're fully compliant that means you have absolutely no issues um, to certification with conditions so if there's minor issues such as uh, implementation of a complaint record or things like that there are certain things that we we can kind of say hey you know you're certified but you need to fix this at the next annual update so please implement it uh, the notice and on compliance for correctable violations. Now that's something, uh, notice of non-compliance, it's an extremely broad spectrum of violations that can be, a notice of non-compliance can be issued for. Um, so if you do receive a notice of non-compliance, call your certifier, talk to them about it, don't panic, um, because notices of non-compliance are not the end of the world, you can correct that violation. Uh, or we could, or there's an issuance of a combined notice of non-compliance and denial for, of certification for non-correctable violations. Those are, I'm gonna go out on a limb, and I know for us those are very few and far between. So as long as you're reporting your actual activities, your past certification history and things like that, uh, it's very rare that you would see this come to you in the mail. Next slide, please. Okay, so at this point then, the final decision maker determines which action, as I outlined, is appropriate. Um, most of the time, it's certification and or certification with minor, minor issues to correct next year. That's usually what happens here for us. Um, so then we will issue an organic certificate. And uh, thus, though, if the operation doesn't comply, then we have to issue the adverse action or the non-compliance, as I me mentioned before, in accordance with the USDA NLP standard. But once certified, the operation's certification remains in effect until surrendered, suspended, or revoked. So that means you are certified until you say, I don't want to be certified anymore and surrender uh, your certification. Your certification is either surrender or suspended or revoked by your certifier. Next slide, please. Okay, so you're certified. And the years to come after that, after the initial certification, in order to continue, your operation must submit an updated organic system plan, or OSP, and its fees to the certifier at least once per year to continue organic certification. And additional points to remember after certification has been awarded, because these sometimes are situations that come as a surprise to operations that have went through their very first year of certification, because uh, it just, it just doesn't end at that point. Um, certification, organic certification and compliance is ongoing. Um, just like a any other business conducts business every day, uh, you, your certification is an everyday business for you. So remaining compliant, making sure that uh, all your practices are compliant is vital and, it's, and it is required. Um, the certifier may conduct additional on-site inspections to verify continued compliance with the regulations. We do call these unannounced inspections, and they're conducted as deemed appropriate by the certifier. Uh, the unannounced inspection could include uh, part of the sampling uh, procedure that we are required to conduct on a year-to-year -year basis by the USDA. So. This is just saying, hey, we can we 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 are allowed to drop by whenever we we kind of want to to check in on you. However, the frequency or likelihood of us just dropping in is is pretty few and far between. So, um, but just be aware, you know, try to keep everything up and try to keep everything tidy just in case you'd get an unannounced visit. Next slide, please. Um, operations also must notify your certifier of any ongoing changes that may affect compliance with the regulations. So just as I was saying, just as any business conducts day-to-day -day business activities to keep their business going, compliance is ongoing. It's a day-to-day -day thing. So if you're going to add any new um, products, fields, operations, or labels to your organic system plan, then you should just, just do yourself a favor, give your certifier a call and say, hey, this is what I want to do. 
how should I, you know, what, what do I need to update my organic system plan or is this something that's very minor? Um, uh, I want to add this crop to my certificate and, uh, you know, things like that where you have to issue an updated certificate. Please just give them a call and talk to them. Um, any requests to add new fields, animal species, or facilities typically requires an additional on-site inspection. Um, and the other thing that is, is that can be kind of shocking uh, is records concerning the production, harvesting, and handling of products sold, labeled, or otherwise represented as organic must be maintained for not less than five years beyond their creation. So you have to maintain your organic system plan records, all your records of production for five years. Mm. Next question, or next slide, please. Okay, so we're at the resources page, and this is, I feel like this is the most important part of my presentation. That's why I'm like, use them, they're great at the top. Um, I actually outlined, tried to outline the specific uh, areas of the National Organic Program Standards. I gave the link, specifically subpart C, which is the organic production and handling requirements, and subpart E, which is the certification requirements. Those uh, areas, which it's, you know, sometimes it can serve as good bedtime reading because <laughs> it can get a little complex with the language, but those are the actual rules. Those are the rules we are looking at every day to evaluate your operation. So having some familiarity with them is really good. Um, another great resource is the National Organic Program Handbook. This is complementary to the National Organic Program Standards because when the USDA feels that a clarification or a guidance needs to be issued on a specific rule in those National Organic Program Standards, they will issue a guidance document or a, a policy memo that then gets put into this National Organic Program Handbook. Uh, they are able to clarify certain things like specifically I can name right off the top of my head um, seed guidance for organic production. There is some uh, there's some navigating to do when you're an organic producer and you're sourcing seeds. They actually released a, a document into the program handbook that gets very specific on what seeds you can use, what documentation you need to keep, um, and, and such. So it, it can be very handy just to take a peek at what they got in there. Um, they also feature uh, the organic certification process uh, document that I actually use as a nice little guide for this presentation because that is from them. That is from the horse's mouth right there. That is what they define as the organic certification process. Um, they also feature these really great handy guides, uh, a general guide to organic certification, a guide for organic crop producers, a guide for organic livestock producers, and also a guide for organic processors. So whichever end of the spectrum you fall on, they actually released a document in this program handbook you can check out. Um, great resource, uh, MOSES, uh, Midwest Organic and Sustainable Education Service. Uh, pro they provide a variety of resources and information. So just going onto their website and navigating it is just an adventure and you can find a lot of great things there. Uh, they actually have a guidebook for organic certification which is really cool and um, they have a search engine where you can find organic certifiers in your area. Granted, it doesn't narrow down to like actual organic, it will find certifiers who do other verifications as well, but at least you could narrow it down to see who's in your area. Next slide, please. And also the, the last one is ATRA. ATRA is also quite phenomenal. They have a, a very large uh, library or, or uh, archive of guidance in preparing for certification, production methods, um, organic crops and livestock. They have it from the, the scientific end and they also have it from the practical end. There are all kinds of source documents to read. Um, also, if you know, farms is a great resource for any of us. I, I'm so sorry, Sue, I did not include farms in here, but I figured if people are already here, they're already using it as a resource. So um, again, tapping into these resources and asking all the questions that you need to ask to get to the bottom of it is great. But my my biggest take home is the best resource of all, you, the certifier of your choice. When you pick your certifier, you are paying for a service. You're paying for the certification and you're paying for them to, to essentially certify you. So keep asking questions. Keep throwing questions at them and, and make them answer you. That is their job. Um, so, and the next slide I think is just my thank you slide, my end slide. So yeah, thank you. Uh, if there is any questions to be had, I am willing to answer them right now.
Anybody out there have any questions? Questions, anyone? Can you tell me uh, the cost of certification? Can you kind of explain how that's determined? Okay, I can give kind of a, how do I, some certifiers, I can go over kind of how some certifiers charge versus others. Um, some certifiers actually charge, uh, they've established base fees for the certification service, for the inspection, which are all variable. I guess my, for an average operation, average small operation, I'll go out on a limb and say it's approximately $1,000 per year. But I do want people to remember um, we have that cost share program that was passed through the last farm bill. Um, there's a cost share program available where you get 75% of your certification funds back. How it's administered is kind of up to each state agency. I know North Dakota Department of Ag uh, gave us, uh, we are in cooperation with them to issue that um, that refund back to our producers. So uh, you have the potential, even though it's going to cost you, you know, out of your pocket, you can apply for that cost share and get reimbursed 75% of your funds. But um, as far as cost, I'm sorry, I kind of digress there. But I just want everybody to remember that that program is available. So ask your certifier about it, no matter which state or area you're in. Um, but some charge base fees, ICS charges uh, based upon cash crop acreage. Uh, there are some or some agencies that base <laughs> that base their their fees um, more upon uh, sales, uh, like a volume of sales. So if you you know they may charge so many cents per bushel or whatever. So it's it's very it's completely variable upon the agency. But just be really upfront with your expectations of how much you want to pay, or well, how much you would desire to pay. Because sometimes I mean it's not like a deal can be cut, but at least you can say you know this is what I was expecting to pay upfront. So what are the actual fees and how how can you help me? Because sometimes there are discounts to be had or like I said the 75% reimbursement back to your age or back to your operation for just being certified organic from our federal government and uh, if I might I am actually a member of the organics advisory board yes in North Dakota and I believe that we have decided to spend some of the allocation of funds that we receive from the state to help send people to conferences like Moses. Um, so if you're interested in that at all, you kind of got to like keep an eye on either our webpage or the North Dakota Department of Ag's webpage, and they'll make announcements as to when we meet. Um, you can call any of the board members for any additional information about that program also. So there's a lot of help out there for you if, if you want to, including education, transition to organic. Yeah, Sue, is that the one you're talking about? Because I thought I got notification the other day that operations that are wishing to transition get, is that what is that what it is? Is that what you're talking about? Actually, operations that are willing to transition get some kind of perk, financial the, perk out of it. Oh, maybe that's what it was. Maybe it was the, tr right, the transitioning farmers get, get, you know, they can get a conference fee to Moses paid. But, you know, Farms has a program called Grants to Grow that was actually set yep specifically for transitioning to organics. It's a yep. loan grant program up to $10,000 to be able to um, transition. You have three annual payments the first three years, and then your interest doesn't kick in until the fourth year of your um, note. And a third of what you ask for up to $10,000 comes by way of a grant that does not have to be repaid. That's absolutely fantastic. So yeah, that that help is out there, and that's why that's why I said you know going to these websites, going to the farms website, going to all the other websites, not only for resources, but looking for ways or looking for opportunities to be able to uh, financially uh, ease the ease the pain of the financial transition into organic, or ease the pain of of the fees for for being certified organic. Ultimately, the fees are charged. We actually that is something I should also add that the certifiers have accreditation costs, and I'm not trying to play the violin for the certifiers, but um, we do pay thousands of dollars every year to be accredited to uh, the USDA National Organic Program to be able to perform the service of certification. So. Um, charging the fees is kind of an exchange. It's a service, and so. 
I, I just want to to let everybody know that you know we we're we're paying we pay for our audits too and we pay for our certification so it's it translates down the line but help with that ask your certifiers they're supposed to have that information if there's tools to be had um, especially financial tools that they should have them we do I know we try to keep very up to date um, on what uh, perks or what financial perks are out there or reimbursements for our operations so. Well, awesome. If there are no more questions, I can hear my email ding and deeper. Um, <laughs> that's the bad part about this is that then I can't I can't check my email while someone else is talking. Cause well, I'm and my apologies <laughs> to anybody who, uh, who remained here and to Sue, especially to farms. I apologize for that terrible, terrible first few minutes there where technology escaped me completely. My computer just had a fit. So I'm going to investigate as to why that happened, but I think anybody who either um, stayed stayed on, bared with us, or came back on um, and appreciate everybody's time. If there's any questions that you have, you may contact ICS. You can contact International Certification Services at 701 Four eight six three five seven eight, and uh, just give us a call. We'll be happy to help with any questions you have. No matter, no matter. Feel free, ask away anything. <laughs> Super. Well, um, I we're at four minutes to one, so we ended up being just fine. And if we ever do this again, we'll have a practice session. For I am so okay. sorry. Yes, I know. <laughs> No, 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 I'm going to get it looked at. As soon as I'm off, I'm going to check out, check out 